Welcome to the controversial entries in George Q. Cannon's journal published in 2018 video. All right, a little bit of information about uh, George Q. Cannon. He was an editor, a publisher, a businessman, an educator, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, a territorial delegate in Congress, and a counselor in the First Presidency. So he was pretty high up in the church and was probably the most well-known general authority uh, next to Brigham Young. All right, uh, this journal uh, by George Q. Cannon was published by the Church Historians Press on June 27, 2018. Uh, these are the same publishers as the Joseph Smith Papers. And uh, these are two great historical projects that the church has done. And uh, I commend them for doing it. This is a kind of a new age of history for the church that they're willing to publish a little bit more controversial materials in the Joseph Smith Papers and uh, also in this journal of George Q. Cannon. And they've uh, published a couple other journals as well. All right, Cannon's journal covers the years 1849 to 1901, 52 years of information. So that is, that is awesome. Nice, long record of 52 years of the church. All right, his journal was written in 52 physical volumes, as pictured above is one of the volumes. It's kind of a small volume, but 52 of them for a total of about 6,500 pages. So this is, you know, this is kind of like a Wilfred Woodruff's journal. It's one of the largest uh, journals uh, that's ever been published. And these George Q. Cannon journals are available online for free. A uh, nice resource that the church has provided online at churchhistorianspress.org backslash George Q. Cannon, and you can just uh, look this up. Uh, the search is not very good, uh, like it is in most uh, church online uh, resources or websites. Their search is just terrible. I don't know why they don't just uh, link it up uh, to Google search, uh, you know, like Google local search for this particular website, but they insist on using their, their crappy search engines. All right, uh, we're going to first start out with the Adam God doctrine. I did a whole long video about this, about five hours long. Uh, I didn't have this journal at the time I made that video, so I'm going to I'm going to add uh, a few things in this video about Adam God from this journal. Uh, the entry is November 18, 1882. George Q. Cannon says that he had a most delightful conversation with President John Taylor upon doctrine. Uh, Cannon listened to his views, that's John Taylor, listened to John Taylor's views about our Father in Heaven, uh, in other words, Adam <laughs> and Jesus. Those uh, brackets are George Q. Cannon's, they're not mine. So he says, I listened to J President John Taylor's views about our Father in Heaven, Adam. <laughs> so that's pretty interesting. All right, uh, another entry on June 11, 1892. According to the teachings of President Brigham Young, Adam was our father and our God and the father of the Lord Jesus. That's pretty specific reference there. Adam was the father of the Lord Jesus that would make him our heavenly father. All right, he also talked about the disagreement that Apostle Orson Pratt had with President Brigham Young. They disagreed on this Adam God doctrine, so here is another good source uh, documenting that. This entry is June 11, 1892. I then referred to the case of brother or Apostle Orson Pratt, who had been a strong opponent of President Brigham Young in regard to this doctrine of Adam God. Pratt had been a strong opponent to President Brigham Young in regard to this doctrine, Adam God. Orson Pratt did not believe in the doctrine, and he tried to convince uh, President Brigham Young uh, in the error of his ways 
course, President Young would not be corrected. Okay, the same date of entry here. I, George Q. Cannon, related instances where Orson Pratt came very nearly losing his standing in the church and would doubtless have lost it if President Brigham Young had not been determined to hold on to him. Uh, Young wanted to keep Orson Pratt because he was a very smart guy and a good writer. Uh, he was one of the main defenders of polygamy. Uh, uh, Brigham Young really liked the work that he had done in The Seer, uh, in that paper, which became a book later on, uh, defending polygamy. And there's, there's a book uh, written by Gary James Bergera. It's called Conflict in the Quorum. The whole book is about these disputes between Orson Pratt and Brigham Young about Adam God, etc. So it's called Conflict in the Quorum, Orson Pratt, Brigham Young, and Joseph Smith. All right, same entry here. Uh, he, Orson Pratt, contended against this doctrine of Adam God for a long time, but for some time before his death, he ceased his opposition. Orson Pratt acknowledged that whenever he contended against Brother Brigham on these points of Adam God, his mind was filled with darkness and he did not feel happy. That's because he's taught to believe that Brigham Young is a prophet and, you know, going against the prophet is going to cause you some cognitive, dis cognitive dissonance, even if you're right. <laughs> even if Adam is not God and Orson Pratt is right, still caused him uh, stress uh, in his mind, his mind was filled with darkness, and he did not feel happy. Okay, but when he, Orson Pratt, received the doctrine of Adam God, he received it, and submitted to the teachings of President Brigham Young, his mind was light and clear, and he had peace. So in other words, when he came in line with the teachings of Brigham Young about Adam God, then his mind was light and clear and he and he had peace so we can interpret uh this entry here uh that uh, george q cannon believed that adam was god uh i guess orson pratt finally came around <laughs> to believing this or at least he wasn't fighting uh, president brigham young about it anymore and so yeah these guys uh, uh, believed in adam god I, George Q. Cannon, said that this was the experience of Orson Pratt and we would do well to profit by it. In other words, you would, you would do well to follow the prophet. You would do well to believe in Adam God. And, of, uh, of course, uh, Orson Pratt's pictured above here. All right, same date, uh, same entry here, uh, June 11, 1892 for, for all of these slides here. Uh, this one is documenting the fact that uh, President and Prophet Wilford Woodruff also believed in Adam God. Uh, so we got Brigham Young believing it uh, for sure, George Q. Cannon, Wilford Woodruff, uh, John Taylor. Okay, President Wilford Woodruff made some excellent remarks and bore testimony to the truth of the position that I had taken and the views that I had set forth that Adam is God. So here we have a good source uh, stating that President and Prophet Wilford Woodruff also believed in Adam God. All right, another interesting uh, entry here about God coming down and having sex with Mary uh, in order to father uh, Jesus Christ. This is something that a lot of the early church uh, leaders taught, and, and George Q. Cannon was one of them. June 11, 1892. I said that we knew that the Savior received his tabernacle through procreation, in other words, sex. And then we have the little meme above, poor Joseph, God was a hard act to follow. So God had sex with Mary, and then Joseph was you know, married to her, I guess, for a time. Okay, another statement about this uh, on the same date. We have been taught that there was a celestial being who overshadowed, in other words, had sex with the Virgin Mary. A, cel a celestial being had se sex with the Virgin Mary and begat the tabernacle of Jesus, who was the Son of God, and he was born of a woman. 
Uh, funny little meme here above. We got God and Mary in bed together. <laughs> oh, Mary, that was immaculate. All right, another little interesting entry here on January 5th, 1893. Alfred Lamborn has finished the picture of Adam on Diamond. It is an excellent painting showing the spot where the altar of Adam is supposed to have stood in Missouri. <laughs> so Garden of Eden in uh, Missouri. The altar of Adam uh, is supposed to have been there in Adam and Diamond in Missouri. Uh, it, in this altar, apparently, <laughs> later on, uh, some members of the church found fossils in that rock or, or in that altar, the supposed altar. They found fossils that, of course, were much older than Adam. So that, that was pretty funny. All right, an interesting entry here about James E. Talmadge. Uh, James E. Talmadge uh, had a PhD. He was a geologist, I believe. He was a scientist. And he had studied evolution. Uh, he started to become unsettled on this idea of evolution, that maybe man was more than 6,000 years old, <laughs> the antiquity of man. And maybe there was, you know, pre-Adamites, uh, you know, before 6,000 years ago. Because, of course, if you're a scientist, you learn this kind of stuff. So an entry on September 13, 1899, it says, I, George Q. Cannon, fancied from the drift of his, James E. Talmadge's talk, that he himself was unsettled on some points. For instance, the antiquity of man, how old man is, and whether there were more progenitors of our race than Adam, pre-Adamites, you know. Human race goes back 150,000 years at least. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you're a scientist, it's going to cause you some cognitive dissonance. And apparently Talmadge gave a speech called uh, The Theory of Evolution, a lecture by a Mormon scientist. All right, uh, here's an entry on February 1st, 1881 uh, in Cannon's journal. Uh, he sounds like a white supremacist <laughs> or a Nazi. Uh, he says the Honorable J. Floyd King of Louisiana, I, th I think he was in the House of Representatives, asked me our belief respecting intermarriage with inferior races, particularly the Negro. So it's interesting that he talks about uh, races who are not white, <laughs> and he calls them inferior. Uh, and then he says one of the infer inferior races is the Negro uh, or the African American, etc. I told him our views that we believed in procreation and in preserving the purity of the dominant or pure Aryan race. <laughs> uh, preserving the purity of the dominant or pure Aryan race. Uh, you know, something that Hitler might have said. All right, he also tells the very interesting story about Jane Elizabeth Manning James. Uh, Cannon calls her Black Jane, quote unquote. <laughs> Uh, hey, Black Jane, how you doing? Entry on August 22, 1895. He says, Black Jane, quote unquote, is extremely solicitous to have the privilege of going to the temple and receiving her endowments. And of course, uh, Jane is pictured above. All right, same entry here. Uh, we, that, I guess that's canon and some other general authorities. We decided that it would not be advisable to grant her request to go to the temple. So she's, she was a good Mormon. She did everything she was supposed to, but uh, they would not let her into the temple because she was black. Uh, as she belongs to a race concerning whom there has been much said, but nothing of a character to warrant us in administering the ordinances of the temple to her. There's been a lot said, 
but there's been nothing said by the prophets and apostles of a character to warrant the church in administering ordinances to black women or to black people. Black people could not go to the temple. Uh, we, and yeah, I guess it was the first presidency. We, the first presidency, had a very full conversation concerning the colored race and their rights under the gospel. So that was too bad. That it was probably uh, crushing uh, to Jane. All right, and then Cannon gives some justification for why this had to be, why black people could not go to the temple and get their endowments. It was related to me by President John Taylor, and it was this, that Abel, having been slain by his brother Cain before he had posterity, the fiat of the Lord had been that Cain's descendants should not receive the blessings of the priesthood until Abel's posterity should come forward and receive tabernacles and the priesthood. So all, I guess all of the descendants of Abel, all the white people, had to receive uh, the priesthood first. Okay, same entry here. Uh, the Negro race have been debarred from the priesthood. Of course, it may seem like a hard thing, but if we, if we knew all connected with the matter and the causes which produce the blackness of their skin, he's going to tell us what the causes are, and then he's going to uh, talk about the pre-existence. So this idea did not originate with Joseph Fielding Smith. It came uh, a long time before, like 50 years before, uh, with people like um, George Q. Cannon and John Taylor. And then John Taylor said he got the information from Joseph Smith, which we'll talk about on another slide. And then here's a meme here. It's a letter from the First Presidency to Dr. Lowry Nelson, July 17, 1947. Uh, from the days of the prophet Joseph, even until now, it has been the doctrine of the church never questioned by any of the church leaders that the Negroes are not entitled to the full blessings of the gospel. So, again, another interesting statement uh, in a letter from the First Presidency. All right, so then Cannon continues. Uh, he gives his justification uh, why blacks could not have the priesthood and go to the temple. And all that had taken place in the spirit world, we would see that the Lord in this case, as in all others, is just. So it's something they did in the spirit world. Uh, they were neutral. They were not valiant. Uh, kind of fence sitters, as, as some of the general authorities have said. And here's a picture of the preexistence. I guess that's God uh, with some of his spirit children and... Uh, three white ones and one black one. All right, another question that came up and that he wrote about on December 16, 1897, uh, talking about intermarriage. The question also came up whether a white man who was married to a woman having Negro blood in her veins could receive the priesthood. So a white man marrying a black woman uh, with Negro blood, could this white man receive the priesthood? You might be surprised at the answer here. All right, same entry here. I explained what President John Taylor had taught me when I was a boy in Nauvoo concerning this matter, and he had received it from the prophet Joseph Smith. So that's interesting. These kind of racist doctrines George Q. Cannon got from the President John Taylor and Taylor said that he got them from the prophet Joseph Smith. All right, so apparently this is what Joseph Smith said uh, to John Taylor, and then John Taylor told Cannon. Uh, Joseph Smith uh, said that a man bearing the priesthood who should marry or associate with a negress, a black woman, or one of that seed, if the penalty of the law were executed upon him, he and her and their offspring would all be killed. The white man should be killed. <laughs> uh, the black woman killed. And any, ba any babies that they have should also be killed. Taylor says he got this from Joseph Smith. So this is very interesting because it's hard to find uh, these kind of statements uh, from Joseph Smith. 
And pictured above, I guess we have an electric uh, chair. All right, same entry, uh, I guess, still quoting uh, Joseph Smith here, uh, saying that it was contrary to the law of God for men bearing the priesthood to have association with that seed. And that seed are those who had the curse of Cain uh, or the, those that had a black skin. All right, so here we have the the spirit world or pre-existent doctrine expressed apparently by President Brigham Young uh, that these spirits were not as valiant in the pre-existence. This entry, March 1st, 1900, President Brigham Young set forth the idea that spirits were classified in heaven before they came here and that Cain stood at the head of a class of spirits who were, who were willing to follow him and to come here and take black bodies. So that's interesting. Cain had a little group <laughs> in the pre-existence. He had followers uh, that sought after him. And I guess they were less valiant, uh, neutral, uh, maybe even uh, evil. I'm not sure. <laughs> but these spirits followed Cain. And because of that, uh, they had to come here and take black bodies as, as kind of a punishment. So this this teaching goes uh, all the way back uh, to 1900. All right, uh, same entry, March 1st, 1900. Again, uh, talking about how these ideas came from Joseph Smith. I had a conversation very early in life with President John Taylor. So he's, he's kind of saying the same thing over again. Uh, who told me what the prophet Joseph Smith had said upon this subject. So Joseph Smith told John Taylor, John Taylor told Cannon, I related it today to the council. He, Joseph Smith, told him, John Taylor, that the seed of Cain could not hold the priesthood and that they would be debarred from the priesthood until Abel should have seed who could come forward and receive the priesthood. Uh, so yeah. Interesting stuff. I did a whole video on the racist origins of the Mormon church. And, you know, these kind of statements would have uh, fit nicely in that video. All right. Same date here. I said to the brethren that my view was that no one having any of this blood in their veins, no matter how small a drop it may be, could possibly hold the priesthood. So anybody, uh, any man having one drop <laughs> of Negro blood, African American blood, one drop would disqualify you from holding the priesthood. Uh, of course, women cannot hold the priesthood, but I guess you could say the same thing. If a woman has one uh, drop of Negro blood in them, they can't go to the temple and uh, cannot marry a white man. All right, an entry on August 18, 1900. President Brigham Young had stated positively that no Negro had a right to hold the priesthood. Okay, uh, same date here. He talks about Enoch, who had preached to all except the descendants of Cain. In other words, the black people. He didn't, he didn't preach to the black people showing that they were accepted from the privileges and blessings that the white race were entitled to. Again, white supremacy. <laughs> uh, they were accepted from the privileges and blessings uh, that the white race uh, were entitled to. He also talks about the curse of dark skin coming upon the Lamanites, March 26, 1854. Uh, your fathers, the Lamanites, brought the red skin upon them in consequence of disobedience to the very priesthood which you have now in your midst. If you pay attention to it, it will exalt you, and through it, this curse will be rolled off from you. So this is kind of different than the black people. The Lamanites, if they were valiant, uh, and, you know, kept all the commandments of God, uh, could have the curse of their dark skin rolled off of them. <laughs> of course, that never happened. 
Uh, in the Book of Mormon, it says they will become white and delightsome. Uh, of course, that is not true. All right, he then gives a statement about Mountain Meadows Massacre. This is pretty interesting on an entry on January 27, 1884. Uh, this company, the Fancher Baker Wagon Train, had by their outrageous course provoked the fate which they met. They had it coming. Uh, they, they deserved it. You know, blaming the victim here. <laughs> uh, you can watch my other video about the Mountain Meadows Massacre cover-up. Uh, some stake presidents and bishop in southern Utah slaughtered the Fancher Baker wagon train of men, women, and children, mostly women and children, uh, with the help of the Indians, slaughtered about 120 of them. And one of the apologetics was to blame the victim. And that's what Cannon does here in his journal. They provoked the fate which they met. And of course, the church doesn't even teach us anymore. If you read their latest book on Mountain Meadows Massacre, uh, they say that they did not deserve to be slaughtered. <laughs> I did not justify it and shrank with horror from the contemplation of it but I felt no sense of responsibility connected with it. Of course not. <laughs> That's the same thing that uh, President Gordon B. Hinckley was saying at the dedication of the monument, that the church had no responsibility for it. It was kind of this rogue, small group of Mormons in southern Utah. Uh, of course, you can, wa you can watch my other video about it. It's fascinating uh, about the, the big cover-up. And, uh, you know, why were they covering it, covering it up if they had no responsibility for it? Uh, neither did I think any belonged to us as a people. Any of the responsibility? No responsibility for canon. Uh, no responsibility for the Mormons as a people. And, of course, that's all nonsense and uh, reparations should be paid. Okay, an interesting entry here on Blood Atonement. Did a whole video about this. Uh, this should have been in that video, but I, di I didn't have this journal at the time. Uh, April 17, 1874 entry. Uh, I said that we believed, that's canon, we believe that a man who committed murder, adultery, or seduction had forfeited his life and that it would be better for that man in eternity if he atoned for his crime with his blood in this life. So blood atonement, shedding your own blood to make amends, make amends for or atone for murder, adultery, seduction. There are some other crimes as well that Brigham Young uh, mentions. But he changes a few words here. He, he crosses out a few words, so I'll read it uh, with the words that he crossed out as well. I said that we believe that a man who committed murder, adultery, or seduction ought to be killed, and that he crossed out and put in, uh, had forfeited his life. So, interesting stuff. All right, kind of a secretive passage here that he wrote in his journal. He wrote this in Hawaiian. <laughs> so, uh, apparently this was sensitive information that he didn't want every, everybody to be able to read. He's talking about the Council of Fifty or the Council of the Kingdom and pronouncing prophets as kings. And, you know, that meant king, king of the entire world, <laughs> both ecclesiastical uh, and government, you know, running a theocracy. This was the, the, the dream and hope of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, of course, uh, the United States government uh, beat that idea out of them so to speak. <laughs> Entry here on February 3, 1885. President John Taylor was anointed with oil as a ruler over the kingdom of God here on earth. So or maybe around that time, February 3rd, 1885. The prophet John Taylor anointed with oil as a ruler over the kingdom of God here on earth. He doesn't use the word king. So I'm not sure if John Taylor was to be a king, 
And then he says the prophets Joseph Smith and Brigham Young were received by the Council of the Kingdom. That's Council of 50. They were received as prophet, seer, revelator, and king. So Joseph Smith and Brigham Young were kings. Uh, here's a little um, note here that's on the uh, Council of 50 Minutes, I think. Record of the Council of 50 or the Kingdom of God, 1844. All right. Uh, There's some other interesting entries here in his journal and controversial entries probably uh, about polygamy. There's about 320 mentions of the word polygamy in these journals. Um, I didn't want to go through all that. It, was, it seemed like a, a fairly complicated issue because a lot of the entries had to deal with their negotiations with the government. Somebody could do all that research, uh, you know, and uh, make a book out of it or add it to a book or, or a journal uh, article about all the battles that uh, the church had during this time period uh, with the United States government over polygamy. Uh, so that's for another video or for another <laughs> person to do. I didn't do all those. Uh, but that's going to do it for this video. And I thank you for watching the controversial entries in George Q. Cannon's journal published in 2018 video.